Great. Well, thank you very much for joining me for what I think is going to be an interesting discussion. If I ask my panelists to introduce themselves, would you care to go first? Thank you. I'm Geraldine Lissal. Hold on. <laughs> Looks like the tube going through. Okay. <laughs> Trying again. I'm Geraldine Lissal de Bonnet, and I'm the global director at GS1 Healthcare, working in global office. Uh, I'm Julia Cumberledge, and I think I've sort of met you this morning. <laughs> Kelsey. <laughs> Hello, I'm Kelsey Flott. I'm Deputy Director of Patient Safety in the NHS England Transformation Directorate. Hello, I'm Emma Summers. I'm Programme Head at NHS Statistical. And uh, hello, I'm Alison Cave. I'm Chief Safety Officer at NHRA. Great. Well, we're going to have a, a discussion, but I hope that colleagues will join in. And I think if you could raise your hand if you'd like to make a point or ask a question at any time. We've got one mic that will be roving around, but please please join in if you, if, if you want to. But Julia, could I just start with you? Um, one thing you didn't mention, which was in your report, and which collectively we persuaded the government against their better interest to adopt, uh, which is the appointment of a patient safety commissioner. And I think the appointment, the regulation setting this up is going through Parliament at the moment, and I think an appointment is going to be made very shortly. Could you say something about what you think the Patient Safety Commissioner will do, and how will that person impact on what we're discussing today? Well, <clears throat> I, I think what we were very concerned about, and I mentioned this morning, is this fact that nobody is joining the dots. Nobody is looking over the whole scene. And we want this person, once appointed, to actually do that, but be the voice for patients as well. And one of the things that's really struck me is that so often people do forget the patients. When you go to these great meetings, um, very seldom is a patient even there? And when they are, they're the sort of last person on the agenda. They're an add-on. And they should be the whole raison d'etre for the NHS. This is what we're about. This is what we should be uh, doing all the time for patients. And that voice is critical. So we saw this person as somebody of standing, uh, somebody who would, um, as I say, be the voice for patients. Um, who would be really working very much <coughs> with the politicians, with the media, uh, but primarily listening all the time to the patients and joining up these dots and seeing where the problems were arising. And <coughs> we're not saying that there should be somebody who delves down into individual cases unless it's part of a, a whole scene. That isn't the role. The role is much more a helicopter role, but also one of real action, so that politicians will listen to this person. And we looked very carefully at the Children's Commissioner, and we saw the work that the Children's Commissioner had done. And in some ways, this was a model for us. I have to say, <clears throat> one of the things that is absolutely critical, and um, which is resisted, uh, by uh, the Department of Health and others, is, is the independence. This person has to be in nobody's pocket. This person has to be independent and somebody who will be courageous, intelligent, and be the voice for patients. Thank you. That, that's... But, but can I thank you very much? Because this came out of the Medicines and Medical mm. Devices Act. Uh, and. Um, Philip, well, I've said well, everything I can say about Philip. I mean, he's just amazing because he, <coughs> one of, thank you. One of the things that's really good about the Lords is that it isn't nearly so party political. Of course, Philip has a dig now and again at the government, as he should, because he's in opposition and all the rest of it. But, I mean, it was very interesting last night when you were talking about uh, vaccine uh, problems uh, and, and what had happened on that. And I was coming in on redress for patients. 
Um, the two of us were very complimentary, I thought, uh, about this whole issue. And so there are often occasions when Philip supports me and I support Philip. And in fact, I did have uh, one issue where I went against my government uh, and we had a vote. And uh, what I wanted is going back to the Commons uh, because it was agreed in the House of Lords as something that was actually quite sensible. So, Julia, let me ask you another question about the Patient Safety Commissioner. If, for instance, uh, not sufficient progress is made with EPOT, that despite Kelsey's obvious determination, there is uh, reluctance in the system to adopt it wholeheartedly, would you expect the Patient Safety Commissioner to knock on the door of ministers and say, come on, you've got to do something about this. Is that the sort of thing? Absolutely, because what we're saying is this person shouldn't be party political, but should be political. And the first thing they have to do is to come and knock on your door. Good. Well, that will be very good. So good luck with the appointment. Thank you. Kelsey, can I just come to you? Um, and really, you showed the progress charts, in a sense, the various stages towards... Uh, adoption. Um, I've dabbled in IT at the Department of Health myself uh, 20 years ago and um, the discovery I made is that whatever policy you have and how many edicts you issue, you're dependent on many hundreds of organisations in the NHS to do what you think is the right thing, but which for them, uh, and Let's be clear, you know, if I were a chief exec of an NHS trust at the moment, I'd be looking at huge pressures in terms of money, workforce, getting back to normal after COVID, but then normal before COVID, we were not meeting any of our targets in England. And all I would see is huge pressure and then you and your colleagues are coming along and saying, ah, oh, but you need to do this. Uh, how, you know, how, are you going, what, how are you going to embed this? Well, a really good question, thank you. And I think it's one of the things we've found with the Epoch programme is that we know the benefits and we can see them so clearly. We can see the benefits that came out of Scan for Safety. But as you say, the, the pressures in organisations are real. And it's not just COVID pressures and patient pressures. There are a series of targets, as you mentioned. Our priorities and our policies are not always aligned. So organizations are trying to meet different things at different times with one set of resources. So we can understand why it's difficult to suddenly adopt a new program and cut through all of the, the priorities that they already have. I think one of the major things we can do to, to support that journey is improving the communications of the benefits that we do have, but also sharing that best practice. Now, that sounds simple, but when one organization can show that they've reduced errors and saved money, and that can be transplanted at another organization, that actually, I think, will help. And we've not done yet a good enough job at articulating those benefits or making it easy to do so. Um, lots of trusts have great practice that they want to share. Where can they do that? How do they do that? How do they facilitate a dialogue and a conversation? So I think that's one of the things at the centre that we want to focus on. So I noticed on your one, actually it was your next to last slide, um, <coughs> one trust that said that the adoption epoch had yes. been paid for within two months. Two months. Um, the experience of Scan for Safety showed similar evidence. Um, that point of view, anyone, patient safety commissioner, will say to ministers, the Secretary of State, this is a no-brainer. Yeah. So why aren't you doing it? Absolutely. <laughs> so agreed. But I, I think one thing that we've found is that actually explaining some of those benefits and proving them is not always easy and not always the first thing that came up, especially following COVID. Mm. So getting kind of more tech, new tech, using data in different ways um, is, is still a challenge, even when we can see other examples of where people have paid for it in two months. But we still have to keep driving home that message and we still have to 
keep bringing more organizations into the fold. Right? Uh, Scan for Safety had the six pilots, Epoch has the kind of seven that we're working with, but we've all worked with a whole plethora of organizations. So getting more into that pilot and running stage, I think, is important. Thank you. Emma, can I just ask, I mean, NHS Digital has been facing many of the similar challenges. Um, I mean, do you feel, uh, Julia talked about how many of us use the NHS app, and there's, all, there's been a revolution, hasn't there, over the last two years, really. Um, do, you, is, do you think that's being replicated in the health service? Do people recognise that something's changed, that there is a, the public are, are up for this? I mean, I certainly hope so. Uh, it certainly w warms my heart, the fact that the NHS app is, is being so widely used yeah. and the fact that the, the pandemic allowed that to happen and was the sort of impetus for, for that change is, is, is hugely encouraging. Um, and we're certainly seeing, you know, lots of uses of, of new technology. You know, clearly we've all been on, on screens for, for the last two years and, and that's been happening across the health service as well. So I think there's lots of evidence that... Um, there is change and there's an appetite um, for change. But at the same time, there's a recognition that there's a, a huge amount of different sort of digital maturity out there. So there's, there's different challenges for those different organisations. And I think we need to be mindful of that whilst we're all passionate about wanting to support the organisations to be, you know, collecting more data, scanning that data where, where possible. The organisations are starting from different positions. They've got different systems that they need to collect, connect together and you know at the center we want to support sort of interoperability and to introduce standards to support that interoperability across the different systems in the nhs but often organizations are facing that interoperability challenge within their own organization let alone supporting that wider sort of connectivity so there's huge challenges but but i think you know part of the reason we're here is to talk about about standards and and I think that is definitely something that can help. Um, and so that's one of the things that we have introduced this year. We've, we've introduced an information standard about surgical devices and implants, which sets out you know, what is the sort of minimum data that should be collected from, in terms of devices, in terms of the patient identifiers and, and clinical identifiers. Um, so the, you know, the next steps will be about helping organisations to make sure that they're um, able to embed that data in their healthcare organisations using scanning technology or, or using web forms that we've, we've developed centrally to support that. Can I just ask, has that essentially been mandated? It has in that we've, we've, we've launched an information standard, so that's been published, and that then um, requires healthcare organisations to work with their system suppliers to make sure that they're collecting that data. So within the next six months, we would expect that data to be, to be collected. And I think that will certainly be help in terms of supporting the EPOC journey that, that we've started. Um, but as I say, recognising different digital maturity out there, we do have mechanisms for organisations to collect that data using web forms if they're not able to introduce scanning technology. Thank you. Uh, I mean, Alison, clearly from MHRA point of view, um, you, um, in your role as a regulator for medical devices, have got a big interest in implants, other mm. devices. Mm -hmm. Could you say a little more about where you come into this and what yep. you see the potential of using standards in the way we've discussed this morning? So for, for me at MHRA, is the key thing is to be able to unambiguously identify a device accurately to have all of that information that Kelsey's talked about, about the surgical procedure, because there's lots of parts, uh, moving parts here. We need to understand all of the sort of data around a procedure, but critically for me, what I then need to be able to do is link that evidence at the implant with the long-term health outcomes. It's what Baroness Cumberledge talked about today, because what's challenging for us is it's much easier to link an adverse incident with a device when they're temporarily associated, when they happen very soon afterwards. But when they happen years down the line, that's the real challenge because there's lots of confounders and biases that come into, into the analysis and understanding the causality of those associations. So what we really need is for all of the wonderful information that's going to be collected through EPOC 
to ultimately link to an individual patient and then link in to their primary healthcare record where we can then extract that data when we see problems down the line and really understand at scale what are the issues, what are the trends, what are the associations, what happened if you had a different device, a different procedure, and start to really analyse what the root of some of the problems are. I think that will give us huge power. So we're incredibly supportive of the work that's going on through EPOC, but ultimately we need to link it to those longer-term health outcomes to understand better what that association is. Thank you. I, I mean, it's interesting, GS1, of course, uh, developed first in retail and the example of supermarkets mm. who where uh, a batch of tin, say, baked beans had been contaminated mm. uh, one way or another, where traceability is there, where the customer can be traced, uh, is an example where we, ideally mm. we would want to find ourselves. Yeah, absolutely. We need to be able to link an individual patient at the point of care through over years to their long-term health outcomes. Because many of the very terrible experiences that Baroness Cumberbatch told about today happened years down the line, and the patient didn't know exactly which device they had, and therefore we need to be able to have that complete, accurate, unambiguous identification with all of the factors around that procedure and then link through to those long-term health outcomes. That will help us at the MHRA to identify those safety signals and then put in appropriate risk mitigation because we all want to be able to target that risk mitigation. We all want to be able to understand the factors around the event which led that person to have an adverse outcome, whereas another person had benefit because many patients do have benefit from procedures and medicine. We mustn't forget that. Um, and we need to be able to target our risk mitigation to those who suffer harm while allowing those who, who receive benefit to still receive the device or still receive the medicine. So just um, thinking about the devices regulation in particular, I mean, you obviously have, a, have to have a very close relationship to manufacturers. Mm -hmm. um, what are the challenges, would you say, for the manufacturers? And to what extent through you can you regulate their cooperation, or does it come through the standards that are set for the NHS, and then it goes into their procurement, um, the supply chain requirements? I think it's a whole ecosystem. Everybody has a part to play in safety of medicines and devices. So yes, the manufacturer has a part to play by ensuring, ensuring that unique de device identifier gets recorded, and please put it in our registration system that we're collecting currently. Currently, we only have about 30% of the UDI is in there, so we want to get a really accurate identification of the device, mm. accurate packaging, really good information for use with the device, so making sure that you know, the, the instructions for use are um, as clear as possible and supporting the safe use. But then it's up to the ecosystem to record that data and to allow us to be able to track long-term the outcome. So I think everyone has a part to play in it. Thank you. Um, can you insist on that? Well, with the new legislation, we will have much more powers around safety surveillance. So we're putting in things like post-market surveillance plans, but that's what we're proposing, which will allow us, in the way that we already do for medicines, to identify the risks at the point of approval and say, these are risks, these are the things we want you to look for when you're using this device. And these are the things we really need to be able to record and track. It gives us an opportunity to have more robust post-marketing obligations around reporting. It gives us more obligations um, around classifications of devices so that they're appropriately classified. So the devices we're most worried about, um, in particularly the implantable devices, are the ones that we can track more carefully and appropriately. So I think we will have more powers once the legislation is in place and the consultation is, um, is finished. Well, the consultation is finished. We're just in the point of uh, looking through all of the comments and we will be reporting soon on that. I mean, essentially, this is post-Brexit yeah. uh, legislation where you're free, subject to parliamentary approval, to set your own rules on, yes. in terms of regulation. Yes. So 
I mean, what we need is a, the powers to appropriately track, identify, track, and yep. have the appropriate reporting in place so that we do see these adverse incidents really in a timely way. We want to know as soon as possible, and ideally, we want to move to a situation where we can better predict when an adverse event may happen, mm. whether it be with a patient, with a device, sorry, or with a medicine. Um, so we're trying to put in new processes and new initiatives um, where we can better predict when a patient may be at harm from events or, or an adverse event, such as, for example, um, for a medicine, um, if they have a pharmacogenetic factor underpinning the um, adverse uh, drug reaction, we can then predict that, we can prevent that patient even receiving the medicine so that we're really better at targeting our risk mitigation activities. Because at the moment we have fairly blunt tools because we don't always understand the mechanism that underpins an adverse drug reaction. So we need to better understand that and then we can target better the drug to the patient who will receive benefit and not harm. I want to bring Geraldine in, but Julie, you wanted to intervene. You said about the long term and all the rest of it, so agree with you. Um, but one of the things patients were telling us was it was very hard for the MHRA to really understand the problems that they were having. And you have the yellow card system. And they were saying the yellow card system simply doesn't work. And very often they found the yellow card had been sort of almost binned and nobody had taken any notice. Mm -hmm. And I just wondered if you need to reconsider how you can actually take on board what the patients are telling you, whether you could have a system that is a bit more uh, user-friendly. Could you just explain the yellow card system? Because yes. yes. The yellow card system is actually was introduced at the point of thalidomide very many years ago. But it, mm. it is a system by which ago. we capture what we call spontaneous reports. So they're reports from healthcare professionals, from manufacturers, but also very much from patients who have a suspected adverse incident, whether it's to a device or a medicine, um, and they report that into us. And we collect those, we get many thousands a year, we collect those and analyze those to look for signals. Um, and, and then we take appropriate regulatory action. So this is a yellow card system. Um, it's been amazingly important through COVID. We've had something like 400,000 yellow cards associated with the COVID vaccine. And that's allow us to do real time uh, risk mitigation of that enormous deployment of, vaccine, of vaccines through the COVID pandemic. Um, but I will, uh, I'm very happy to say that we are launching a new yellow card platform called Safety Connect, which will be a common vigilance platform, which will for the first time bring together all of device reporting, all of adverse drug reaction reporting, as well as blood rea uh, reactions to blood products and uh, uh, defective medicines under one platform with one team analyzing. It also gives us much more analytical powers because it's a new platform. But importantly, it gives us more powers to feed back to patients um, the results and the downstream consequences of their yellow card. So I very much hope, um, and it's very much our ambition, that the patient will have a much better experience through the yellow card platform in the future. Thank you. Um, I want to come back to the uh, role of the patient because both Julia and Kelsey um, really talked about that. But first of all, Geraldine, um, you've heard what we're doing. Um, we're very interested in the global scene. What can we learn from other countries in terms of the adoption of these kind of safe systems? You can learn a lot. Of course, um, I think if you, if, you, if you really want to learn, you have also to, to understand the system that every country has. And unfortunately, so for pharmaceuticals, as mentioned by Alison, it's much more difficult, even if traceability has been implemented since many years already. The system are always very much centralized. For UDI and so for unique device identification system, a group of regulators, came together and they decided to harmonize, to go into the same direction. And that's really a strength because as, as Julia mentioned, uh, connecting the dots is important. 
So really making sure that uh, when one device is identified as causing issues for patients in one country, ultimately another country could also leverage the unique identifiers on this device and make sure that in their country, patients will not be faced with similar risk. So that's the idea of a unique system of identification of devices. Data and database and all the system for management of data as um, you described as well is a challenge because today interoperability is not so easy. So you can learn from others on the benefits of implementing global standards on making sure that you have consistency in the way the products are barcoded and the fact that you have one barcode for one product uh, so that nerds don't get confused and they can include scanning as part of the routine in the way they treat patients and they deliver care. But it's also important to discuss with other authorities, with other regulators, and to share the challenge, the opportunities that they have seen and try to find a solution which will work across the borders. In one country, you already know which are the challenge to have this harmonization and alignment. So you can imagine that across the world, it's even more challenging, but you can also optimize the benefits if it works. Could you say a little more about how global, I mean, GS1, there's a GS1 in most countries. Yes. How globally GS1 can help? So we can help in different ways first. We can simplify things because you can use one system of standards to implement many requirements, mm. regulatory requirements, tender requirements, but also just continuously, as you said, for retail, just put mm. a barcode on a product to make sure the product can be visible along the supply chain and ultimately when it's used on patients or for customers. So the idea is really to make it simple, is to share education, knowledge like we are doing today, but we do that everywhere and we do that every day. So to share knowledge, to help people to understand the value of giving visibility to product and to link one product to the right data and to make sure that it's used for the patient. And last but not least, it's also consistency because the system that we are implemented is implemented since years. And it's really not rocket science. We have changes here and there, and we try to, of course, embrace new technology and work with those who provide the, those technologies to make sure that the standards are still used and still of relevance. But the foundation is there, it's used, it works. And so this is, this is trust, and this is how we try to, to really help. Great, so thank simplification, you. Education yeah. and trust. Thank you very much. Would anyone uh, like to come in now? Uh, I see a hand raised there. Can you just hold on till we get a mic to you? Thanks. And if you could say who you are and what your background is, that would be great. Hi there, my name is Karan Joshi. I'm the Scan for Safety and IMS lead for Southwest Procurement Partnership. Um, I, you saw a couple of my colleagues on screen there. Um, those with a keen eye might have noticed that they were actually scanning some barcodes off a sheet. And that's because a lot of suppliers don't actually print barcodes, let alone GS1 compliant barcodes on their products right now. So my question is, what work, if any, is being done with the suppliers to get there? And what does that roadmap look like? Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Who, I mean, who'd like to... Go first, Kelsey, would that? Happy to, yeah, to start off. Um, <laughs> so I think it's a really important question. And one thing that particularly in the EPOC program that we did was we made sure that we were working on scanning generally. So we weren't specific to GS1. Um, although I think what we um, have found is that we, you know, there's, there's different barcode standards agencies that we can, can work with. Um, but in terms of kind of engaging suppliers, that was one of the, the core groups that we wanted to work with as well to make sure that there was an understanding not just from the organization side of the benefits of doing this, but also from the supplier side. This is a, a kind of not market entry point, but it's a, a helpful um, scaling mechanism in the market. And so we want to articulate some of the benefits to suppliers as well. So I think there's that engagement piece with suppliers that looks not too dissimilar to what it looks like with organizations. Um, Happy to. Yeah, thank you. For others um, to come in yeah, there, no, too. thank you. Um, Emma, any, any thoughts from you? Um, I mean, again, as Kelsey said, we, we've um, obviously in the 
information standard that we, we've launched does, does look to um, GS1 and, and other sort of data standards to, to make sure that we are um, not, we're being sort of agnostic in terms of that. But I think the question was more about what, what's, what support is being um, given to the, the actual manufacturers to make sure that they're um, labelling their, their products in the right way. And I think maybe some of the MHRA um, sort of uh, regulations might support that. Is that right, Alison? Yeah, so um, as obviously the, um, the 2002 medical device regulation regarding UDIs, it was not mandatory at that point for mm. manufacturers to assign or label devices mm -hmm. with a UDI. But um, as we can move forward into the 2022 Medicines and Medical Devices Act, that does provide MHRA with powers to create that secondary legislation, which will then allow us to mandate a more comprehensive devices regulatory system, and then ultimately to create a transparent registration of that, um, of that, of, of those, uh, of that registration system. So moving forward, uh, we hope to have more powers to mandate, and that will allow us to create that registration system at MHRA, which will support some of the work that Kelsey and Emma are doing um, through the more centralised route. I mean, I, I'm wearing my hat as a president of the Healthcare Supply Association. Uh, uh, of course, uh, in the end, the NHS is in the driving seat in terms of procurement, and uh, I guess it's a question of having pulling all. I mean, it. It's one of the issues about there being so many bits and the NHS is so complex. But we do have it, don't we, in our own hands to sort this in the end. Scan for safety sites wants to come in, but I think some, to, to some extent that they, they have driven some of that as well. I know that there are some sites that, that only purchase product that has the right barcode yeah. on that works for their system. So I think you're right. We do have that opportunity to to make sure that the products that we're, we're buying can be properly traced. I can see the Patient Safety Commissioner sort of uh, coming in and say, come on, you, you can do this if you, if, if you really want to do it, yeah. That was a great question, thank you. Any, any other questions at this stage? Oh, yeah, sorry, it's because of the light. We can't, I can't, I've got a hand there, first of all. So, <laughs> are, you, are you guessing great exercise? Uh, there's a, a chap there in the middle, and then I'm coming over to you. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> well done, thank you. Thank you. It's Pete Sewell from um, Head of Supply Chain from University Hospitals, Plymouth. Um, just same kind of type of question, really. So we're talking about how important data is. Um, we're one of the scan for safety pilot sites we were. Um, and then there was a program to, to get that data from the suppliers. That's gone away. And now suppliers are disillusioned with us. We're disillusioned with suppliers. So where are we going to get this data from? You know, it's, it's okay mandating it. And I think from our personal experience, we get lots of barcodes and lots of data from the product itself. We should be getting it, much, we should be getting it sooner than that. Thank you. <coughs> Any thoughts there? Is the question about how do you get this sort of reference data so that you know when you scan something what it is? Is that the question? Yeah, yeah, it's not to mention yeah. what you get from suppliers. Yeah. Mm. And, and we're having to do that work to what sure. process will the supplier provide in that? Yeah. Or and obviously I, it's being managed beyond the public record. Absolutely. I think we recognise as a centre that that, that that is a gap. Uh, and certainly I know the work that the MHRA are doing will, will, will help to address that in time. And we've also been looking at NHS digital opportunities to bring together the, the data that is, is available in sort of pockets across the system to try to create um, a, a product information master that would then um, help organisations to make sure they've got that central sort of reference. Because we're conscious that that's one of the barriers to sort of setting up a scanning solution is unless you've got that, you're kind of running blind, you've, you've scanned something, but what is it? You know, you've got to have that. And that, I think, was one of the things you put on your slide, wasn't it, Kelsey? Absolutely. So it's, it's definitely one of the main things that we've come up with. And I think one of the headline findings from our work was the, the no PIM, no EPOC. So unless you have that product information master, this isn't going to work to its fullest. And um, we have seen different organisations do different things to create that PIM. And I will uh, signpost to a session later today, we'll, we'll, Phil will cover some of how we can do that better and how we can have a more centralised approach to that. But I know that's also something MHR. Yes, and as I mentioned before, we have got our, our registration database. We have 1.8 million devices now registered 
but only 30% of them currently have a UDI located. So obviously that's what I would urge people to do when you do register your device, please put in the UDI because that will save time later on. Um, and there will, there will be that requirement later. So if you have it, put it in at the time, even if it's not mandatory. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thanks, Philip. Um, Simon Walsh from uh, Britain's uh, second city of Manchester. Oh, hold on a minute. <laughs> hold on a minute. I might have to take the mic away from you. <laughs> Um, thank you very much for that. Very, very interesting. And I think from my perspective as a um, procurement director for Manchester University Trust, uh, a joint procurement lead for Greater Manchester ICS provider procurement, and also a part of the HCSA, which Philip is our um, very distinguished president, I think the message for us is that there's never been a better time for NHS Trust procurement professionals to put forward the case to invest in scan for safety. Uh, the all of the profession, nationally, regionally, locally, has worked tremendously these past two years. Mm. And the benefits in those trusts who have inventory management systems, who have, who, who, who have tracking, who have scan for safety, who have the technology, who have the links with the national and the regional and the local partners, they are the ones who have really benefited these past two years as we seek to ensure continuity of supply on PPE and all the other items. So I, I really think there's never been a better time for trust procurement staff to get this on the agenda, get the investment case going forward and absolutely push it and reach for the stars, to be honest. Now is the time for it to be done. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. And I think there's an important message there, isn't there? Um, that although we've been talking about patient safety and scan for safety, um, for NHS organisations, there's the added bonus of supply chain efficiencies. Uh, and this is, a, this is a double win. Um, and that really is the key message to put over to uh, hard-bitten finance directors and CEOs. Okay, and, and if I can come in there, I think you're absolutely right. And I think there's a... That double win is, um, well, we've got the end of the pan. Well, the end of the pandemic, as some know it. <laughs> I'm not sure it actually is, but but we ha we're coming out of the pandemic where we've seen a change and a shift in how we think about digital technologies. We've also got a landscape where digital and safety are starting to come together, which we haven't seen before. So we've seen patient safety worlds kind of working in one way and digital and CCIO worlds working in another and a trust. And, and now there's a kind of mandate and national commitment to bring those together. So I think that's another sort of double win for being the, the prime point to come in, as you say. Alison. Yeah, the only thing I would like to add to that is also, um, it also enables recalls better. So when things do go wrong, it enables us to identify that device. It will enable you to recall it better but also to tell the patient as well when they've had a device implanted that we may be an issue with or a problem with. We need to be able to feed back to that patient so they understand. Also, when a manufacturer puts out a field safety notice, if they can put a UDI on that, that enables the hospital to identify much more quickly what is the device where there may be an issue with, and that will sort of join the loop, and then we really will sort of have this learning healthcare system, which we're all passionate about, but we need this underpinning technology to deliver it in a timely way as well, because when we do know there's a problem, we want to act as fast as possible. So we've got a few minutes left. Can we just come back to the patient? Because I think Julia said something really interesting about patient ownership of information, but also, of course, this all-important feedback about outcomes. Judy, could you just say a bit more about what you see the potential is here? Well, I think the patient is always oh, should be at the heart of the care that's given. The patient knows themselves extremely well. And one of the things that came through really strongly in our report was the patient's view was dismissed. It was something that our surgeon said, well, a woman of your age, will you expect this? No, you wouldn't. 
and um, other sort of comments were made that were derogatory. And it was, I am the surgeon, and I know best. I know what I've done. And uh, what you're suffering or what you're feeling at the moment, that will uh, go away. And of course it doesn't. For some people, it certainly doesn't. It ruins their lives. So I think we should never, ever forget that, you know, as I said, our raison d'etre is the patient. And it's very easy when you go to big meetings, uh, the transformation board that I go to, and all the different component parts are there, and you were talking, because about getting the right people in the room, but the patient isn't there, and the right person is there. So how do you feed that in? And, and I think it's terribly important that one does. Are we going to get to this point about patients being able to feed back outcome? Are we pretty poor, aren't we, at outcome yes. documentation well, anyway? Well, <laughs> I mean, my review have tried to do that yeah. and to feed back to the NHS um, and beyond the healthcare system as a whole um, what patients are saying because we don't really listen to them. And I, I, mm. I just think that is so key that we should really listen to what they're saying. I mean, to be fair to us as a group, politicians, who are not always as highly esteemed as we might want, it was the politicians who... Exactly. ...engaged with the women involved yes. and forced this. Yes. Because the health service wouldn't listen. Yes. And the regulators wouldn't listen. Exactly. Exactly. Kelsey, do you see EPOCT as being able to embrace this at some point? I think so, and I, I hope that what EPOC can pick up on is um, a journey that we've seen in the NHS around collecting that patient feedback, patient experience information. And I think we've, we have had progress over the last 20 years in, in terms of actually collecting that information, being interested in it, but as you've pointed out, not using it. So we, we do have PREMS, we have PROMS, we have complaints, we have PALS mm. data, this is all coming directly from patients, we need to use it. And part of that is about making the data better so we can link that data and actually use it in yeah. intelligent ways. Um, and hopefully EPOC can do some of that. So when we start using point of care scanning and linking that back as, as Alison has said and making sure that we can track that over time, we can also use the, the information provided directly from this the This point of care scanning is so important, isn't it? Mm. How many times have we seen barcodes, yeah. machines there, not used or used and nothing happens? Absolutely. And the, and the point of care, I think, having been familiar with Scan for Safety and then looking at this programme and kind of the, the amount of benefit that you can unlock and open up when you are point of care and you do have location and sort of immediate information is really important. Thank you. Emma, any thoughts on this? Yeah, I think uh, just building on what Kelsey was saying there, I mean, obviously, it, it, there is some PROMS and PREMS data be, being collected, but the, the worry is at the moment that it's in these sort of silos. So we do want to try and work together as a system, I think, to see how we can, we can bring that together. And one of the things we've been doing this year is exploring how we can help from a pelvic floor perspective. So we've, we've developed a pelvic floor questionnaire to support the initial um, sort of collection of, of data from, from patients. But we're recognising that there is already, you know, some PROMs out there which would also be relevant if we could then sort of join it together. So I think we're in the embryonic stages. There's a huge amount still to do, but I think there's, there's, there's lots of potential there. Thank you. And um, Alison, I think you've already commented on, you know, the yellow card and, yeah. the, and the improvements. But yeah. clearly, from your point of view, um, patient outcome data is vital. Well, we're trying very hard to include patients at all parts of the product life cycle, actually. So we've recently launched a new patient and public engagement strategy. But if I look across the product life cycle, we're trying to involve patients at every part of that to really embed it into our decision making. So for example, we've launched a new innovative licensing um, access process called ILAP. And with that, we're embedding patients in within those pathways around the decision-making, which products do we um, bring into that process? 
How do we design trials better so that the evidence that we gather right at the beginning of either a device approval or a medicine approval actually has that diversification in the patient population, mm. has um, a representative patient population so we understand the risks and benefit across the entire population. And then when we move into safety, how can we better collect spont spontaneous reports? But then I think it's really important to better understand those long-term outcomes. And that's where the linkage through to the patient record, be it a medicine um, prescribed in a hospital or a device implanted in a hospital, really has to link in to uh, the primary care record. Because we already have fantastic systems in place where we can capture those long-term outcomes through those systems. So the MHRA has the clinical practice research data link, which is called CPRD, you may have heard of it, but already captures 24% of the UK population within that database. So we can start to look across a patient journey, cradle to grave record, when did the patient receive that medicine, or when did, it have a when did the patient have a device implanted, and what did the journey look like after that point? How many times did they have um, hospital encounters, come back to the doctor with problems? And then you can start to build up that picture and look at a patient who may have had a different device or a different medicine and compare and contrast. Then we start to pick up friends and association, which is very hard to do in an individual patient to assign that causality. You need data at scale to, to get to that situation. And I think EPOC is the start of linkage up, but also for medicines and, and other healthcare interventions that we have. Can I yes, please. Say one mm. thing? Um, I do actually think that data can do remarkable things. And thank you for the talks mm. we've had today. It's been really exciting. Uh, I do have one reservation, and this is how are we going to manage the single portal, the MDIS, that is now being proposed. Because in our report, we recognized there were two different areas. There was the basic information that I mentioned, uh, the patient, the hospital, the surgeon, the device, and so on. And that you don't need any um, uh, it's not confidential, it's something that's very statistical. <laughs> but then you get into the other area, which we described as registries, where people tell you very personal things. And uh, one of the first registries that were established was by Sir Cyril Chancellor, who's on our team, and it was for um, kidney transplants for children. And so they would ask the children things like, after the transplant, how are you getting on at home? Um, how are you managing with school? And so on, quite personal things. With adults, it can be about um, sexual activity, it can be very personal things. And the early stuff we saw, we were horrified by. And uh, what was going to be uh, it was at that time NHS Digital were going to incorporate the, this information that you wouldn't want shared. It is personal information to you. And where does the consent come? With us, the consent was very clear. With registries, you had to have the person's consent. With the mandated um, statistical stuff, fine. Nobody would worry about that. So uh, with what is being proposed now, I really don't know if the patient will have a chance to say, I am not giving my consent for this to be shared with other people. This is personal to me. And we've already had the problem with GP records in the summer, and that caused a huge hiatus. And it all had to be withdrawn because those records were going to be made very public. Julia, no. I'm going to have to exercise my chair's uh, right. Um, we can't... I think we should leave that floating at the moment because I think, as you know, we are debating this very issue in the healthcare bill at the moment and that's not been resolved. But I think we need to keep that in our minds that this is one of the major challenges about digital transformation. But I did want to come back to Geraldine and just ask, uh, really to finish us off with a kind of global perspective of this 
real challenge of involving patients. Thank you. And I'm glad, Julia, you, you mentioned your reservation because I didn't want to be the troublemaker and I stayed quiet and listened. So when you talked about data, data are important. What I see around the world is by working with regulators, you have the tendency to ask a lot of data because you feel the more data you have, the better equipped you are to eventually tackle one of the specific adverse event reports by one patient to another one because you have all these data so you know everything about the product. It doesn't really work that way. So as a regulator, you should really think of what is needed in terms of product-related data that I will eventually be able to uh, provide uh, healthcare provider with so that when they go close to a patient who is suffering, they can really use it. Mm -hmm. And they don't need so many data. I'm not a nurse, I'm not a doctor, but if you look at the data set required, it's, it's not so much. And this data set is often very much harmonized worldwide because patients are the same wherever they are treated. So that's the idea. Focus on the data which are needed in regards to the product. And then when you're build up, building up your different repository of data, you have the one for UDI, you have one for purchasing, invoicing, you have one for treating the patients and what is happening with the electronic health records. And today, in Europe, we see Udamed, so this wonderful database where all information is, support to be is supposed to be captured, the entire life cycle of the product, also all the corrective measures taken because you had issues with patients, but there is nothing on the patient. The last mile is really missing there. And the question is privacy. How do you include mm. all these data which are very personal, which are really focused on the patient, Sometimes even the relationship with the doctor and the patient is difficult because they don't always manage to put words on, the, on what they feel. And so this last mile is, is a challenge. I'm not sure regulators are the right people maybe to, um, to address that, but definitely by talking to patients or by talking to others, this will help. But this is still not addressed, but it's one of the challenge. Thank you. I mean, I, I, we're not going to be able to develop that perhaps in this session because I do need to draw it to a close, but I think that alongside all the potential we've talked about, there are pitfalls, there are challenges, and that's part of the journey we're on. I think you'd agree, we've had a fantastic discussion. Thank you very much to my panelists uh, for being so great, and thank you very much. <laughs>